The only person who can control your thoughts and your emotions and your feelings is you. But so often we give other people the power. People only have power because we give them the power. And then if we want to be oppressed, then we give them the power to oppress us. I'm not a victim unless I want to be. I'm empowered if I want to be, but I can, I can be in manacles and shackles and chains if I want to be. But that's the genius of Blake, that you can read it like it's a piece of scripture, like a piece of prophecy, like a piece of life advice. William Blake is one of the most visionary poets of all time. The only other poets that are particularly comparable to him are Milton and Wordsworth, Shakespeare, the Bible itself. To, to read Blake is to read prophecy. He's a poet, but he's actually a prophet, and the poetry is just his medium for prophecy and vision. Now, I mentioned Wordsworth, but the thing about Wordsworth is that he seems easy to understand on the surface, but the deeper you get into Wordsworth's work, the more complex he becomes. Whereas Blake, it's actually opposite. Blake initially seems a bit difficult. We're like, whoa, what's so good about this guy? Like, I, he's hard to understand, or it's hard to see that there's more there beneath the surface. But Blake, in his poetry, provides a light for us, and the further deeper into his poetry we go, the more the light grows. So it, he actually becomes less complex the more time and energy we invest into him. Now we're going to talk about London today, I'm going to do a very quick reading of London and then we're going to pick it apart and analyse it. But you should know about the publication history. So. London was published in a volume of poetry called Songs of Experience in 1794, and that was an adjunct, uh, a, a, a mirrored volume to another volume called Songs of Innocence. So Blake wrote two volumes of poetry, Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience, and they kind of reflect each other, mirror each other, contrast each other, juxtapose with each other. Um, interesting to note that Blake actually continued to publish copies of Songs of Innocence independently, but there aren't, re aren't any copies of Songs of Experience that are published independently. They were always published with Songs of Innocence. So the title would be Songs of Innocence and Experience. And in Songs of Innocence you'd have a poem like The Lamb, but the uh, opposite or the companion piece to that in Songs of Experience would be The Tiger. And uh, Blake comments upon the hand of God in both of them, in creating the innocent and the beautiful and the pure, and also the fearful, the sublime, the awe-inspiring. Blake was very, very deeply read in Milton and the Bible, so it is no surprise that he has very visionary power to his poems. To read him is to read vision and prophecy. And when he's talking about innocence and when he's talking about experience, he's talking about two contrasting states of the soul. He's not talking about childhood and adulthood, though that was a preoccupation and a enduring, an enduring theme uh, for the romantics. He's talking about a religious, spiritual perhaps, state of the soul. Anyway, let's read London and let's pick it apart a little bit. London, or William Blake. I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldiers sigh, runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse, blasts the newborn infant's tear, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. So what's interesting is look at this accompanying engraving. So what, the thing is, Blake wasn't actually uh, well renowned or famous as a poet in his own lifetime, though popular and uh, poets who would go on to be uh, quite canonical, such as Coleridge, did read him. Blake wasn't as famous as he now is today. No one really read him. Uh, he was probably more, if not as, famous as an engraver. I mean, he never did particularly well with that either. But he was he started off doing uh, a type of engraving, a type of copper plate engraving, and he referred to these as illuminations. Now, obviously, language is significant, so when you illuminate something, you're not just making something bright or clear or vivid or colourful. There's also a metaphorical aspect to it, where you are showing the way, you're showing light, you're showing vision, okay? It's kind of like if you've ever read Imtiaz Darker's Tissue, she talks about 
light and see in the way and pay and light and paper that you can see through and, and, and things like of that nature. Um, Blake is very much a visionary regardless of medium. Anyway, check out this little um, engraving here of London. It's the thing that strikes me about this, and what's interesting is every engraving was different because it would be an individual process, so they do differ from copy to copy. But it's very colourful, it's very childlike. Something that strikes me is that though London is in the volume of poetry to do with songs of experience, something that always strikes me about Blake is the fact that he feels like a child who is in an experienced world, a too experienced world, a too painful world, a, a world too full of suffering. And the child's voice, when he's in such a world, is one of prophecy. Interesting as well, because if you have an experienced and mature voice and you go into the child's world, you can seem prophet as well, because you're speaking to innocence. But innocence speaking to experience, that's powerful. To hear a child's voice in the midst of so much suffering is powerful. I think that's why he had the two contrasting volumes. And to me, Blake will always be a prophet in the sense that a child is a prophet. So I, I quite like this print. I think it's quite beautiful. It's quite colourful. It's quite um, innocent, despite the fact that it's talking about what it's talking about. Now let's look at the poem. So the thing that strikes me, you might think, hey, this is quite a despairing poem. And you'd be right, because there's there's Lexis from the semantic field of despair. What does that mean? Lexis means words and vocabulary. Semantic field means a memory bank or a word bank of related, interrelated words. So when we look, we see words like weakness, woe, cry, fear, curse, tear. This, this is language, Lexis of crying out, of being in pain, and yet, it's got a really sing-song quality to it, hasn't it? Now, I don't wish to patronise you if you know anything about metrical schemes, if you know anything about prosody, uh, but that's quite deliberate, isn't it? The sing-song quality, because this is quite balladic. One might call this a ballad, and that's because I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and marking every face I meet Marks of weakness, marks of woe. Four beats per line, alternating rhyming schemes. Quite solid on that. It's A, B, A, B, street, flow, meet, woe. Man, fear, ban, hear, cry, appalls, sigh, walls, hear, curse, tear, hearse. This is a ballad. This is a song. And we're having a little sing song, but the, the subject is completely contrasted to sing song. Normally, we sing a ballad and it's about heroic things and it's about delightful things. It's about adventures uh, that have a sense of bravery at the, at the heart of them, have a sense of joy. And it's quite, quite strange, isn't it, that we've got such a joyful metrical scheme, poetic form, uh, with this content. Doesn't that stand out? So what's he doing in the poem? Uh, Blake is walking through the streets of London and the thing is, even you can go walk through the streets of London today, I could go do it later, uh, I might even walk through the streets of London with this poem as the backdrop, because uh, Vaughan Williams actually did, he's a, he's a great composer, he did 10 Blake poems put to music, and one of them was London, and uh, well, you know, actually, let's quickly listen to it now. I wander through each chartered street near where the So you walk in through the streets of London, and this is a very, very common in cities, but it's particularly common in London, and it was common back in the late 18th century, as it is today in the early 21st century. And as he walks through each chartered street, and he's next to the Thames, where the Thames flows, he marks in every face he meets, marks of weakness, marks of woe. So he's walking through and he just sees a crowd of people looking despairing. They're in woe. They're weak. It, we can relate. You've obviously walked through the streets before and seen civilization like that. It's not particularly pleasant. I've actually noticed that people look at you if you smile, if you walk through the streets and you smile on the streets of London, people are like, what? why is he smiling? You know. So in addition to the metrical scheme, the ballad form, which 
reinforces the sing song quality. You've also got, which is very typical of poetry, you've got repetition, uh, which obviously increases the song like quality, especially when you repeat things three times mark, marks, mark. But repetition is always significant in poetry. People don't just repeat words willy-nilly, there's always significance. And if you want to see the significance, you, we can trace back to what Blake originally wrote in the poem. It's interesting because he had a different word instead of chartered, and he still repeated it. Now he could have used chartered and the word that he did use, and, and he got both, yay! But no, he actually used a different word twice. He wrote originally, I wander through each dirty street, near where the dirty Thames does flow. So what's the difference between dirty and chartered? Obviously Blake decided that he didn't want the poem to be about dirtiness. Everybody knows London's dirty, it's grimy. It probably was much more grimy back then. There was probably lots of horse poo in the street. There was lots of smoke, it probably stunk. But he wants to replace that. He wants to replace dirty for chartered. And what does chartered mean? So Blake was actually friends with a fellow called Thomas Paine who had criticised the granting of the royal charters to control trade because he thought that was a form of class oppression. Interesting. So what we're talking about here is we're talking about power, we're talking about oppression. Now if a street is chartered, it means it's controlled, it means it's directed, it means it's named, it's put down on a map. So it makes you think, where, who took control of these streets? You know, well, streets are a man-made construct, so, you know, obviously there's going to be some governmental body, there's going to be some control, there's going to be some part of history where they seized the land from perhaps somebody else. Um, but, so you think, okay, fair enough, the streets are chartered, that's, that's normal. And then he says, near where the chartered Thames does flow. Now, uh, rivers, uh, streams, large bodies of water, they flow naturally, they're a part of nature. Are you saying that not only are the streets chartered and controlled, right? And we're thinking about oppression now. We're thinking about people getting trapped. People, and you know, we're thinking about people feeling weak, feeling despairing, feeling in woe, crying out because perhaps they are oppressed. But now the water as well is also chartered. So you've got all these people, and and you, he can mark in their faces signs of woe. Why is it linked to the chartering? Is it linked to the this idea of being shackled? Well, it's interesting because in the next line, he talks about the mind-forged manacles. What are manacles? Manacles are shackles. They keep you enslaved. Well, it's interesting because though chartered, if you charter a street or you charter uh, the Thames, it's actually a real physical wrenching of control, You that can translate to the mind. So nobody's actually physically oppress oppressing these people on the streets of London, but it looks as though they are, and it's all to do with the mind. So he's probably relating, he's talking about this very real sense of power and divide and oppression in the streets of London results in people being trapped in their minds, victimized in their minds. Stage one is they seize physical power and they charter it and they keep you down, they keep you divided. Step two is you are miserable and you feel trapped in your own mind. Now I want you to think about your own life. Has anybody who you can see tangibly somebody exerting control and by somebody I don't mean an individual, I mean, it might mean a body, and then that results in you having an oppression of the mind. Like people can't actually control your mind. People can't, the only person who can control your thoughts and your emotions and your feelings is you. But so often we give other people the power they're, and they're chartering our mind. Not even chartering though. Chartering sounds like it's relatively civilized. Whereas mind forged manacles, manacles, to have your mind in manacles. I love that phrase. It's forged by the mind. And then it makes you question, well, this chartering, this uh, control here is just a construct of the mind, really. People only have power because we give them the power. And then if we want to be oppressed, then we give them the power to oppress us. Yeah, I'm not a victim unless I want to be. I'm empowered if I want to be, but I can, I can be in manacles and shackles and chains if I want to be. That's some of the stuff I'm thinking when I'm reading London and when I'm reading Blake, and that's why I think he was a visionary. Did he put all this stuff in here? People could argue, oh, he didn't really mean that, did he? Yeah, I think he did. I think that's the genius. Whether it was conscious or not, I think it probably was very conscious and very deliberate, but that's the genius of Blake, that you can read it like it's a piece of scripture, like a piece of prophecy, like a piece of life advice. 
They say that you should only read great literature for aesthetic appreciation, but I don't believe that's true. I think great literature can make us better, and I think we can read fiction as though it were non-fiction, and we can read poetry by Blake as though it was prophecy and become better people. That's why I love Blake so much. And what's interesting is this idea of marking is quite similar as uh, chartering. It's like put, when you put a mark upon a page, you stain it, you take control of it, you harm it in a way, don't you? If you mark something, it's like you cut something or nick something or injure something. And he really wants to really tangibly let you see the physical manifestation of this chartering. Mark, I mark in every face I meet. Marks of weakness, marks of woe. And it makes you wonder, you're the one doing the marking, active. I mark, or and mark, so you're marking. That means you yourself are creating it. So you start thinking about your mind and this idea of what's reflected is projected, what's projected is reflected. Now you're seeing marks of weakness in other people, but is that because you yourself are weak? You're seeing woe in other people, but is that because you yourself are in woe, in a state of woe? Perhaps if you were happy and felt free, you would see that upon the faces of other people. Just an idea. And then it's like, are you complicit? Are you, are you, con you know, you, you are creating the woe in the world by marking it. You have a hand in doing it. Just some things to think for little lines. They seem innocent on the surface, don't they? But then you scratch a little bit and you find stuff that can change your life. He says, in every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, so every, every, and it's like, really? Every? Every? He wants you to say, see, every, and then he's linking this idea of man, and he's linking them, the very next line, infants, they're the same, in every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, so in every man is an infant, in every person is a child, man, woman, have children inside them. Blake is seeing them, and this is a song of experience, and he's seeing these children oppressed. He's like, they're children, just like the infants. They're walking to the street, they may not look like children, but they are, they have the same cry, you know? In every voice, he says, in every ban, the Mayan forged manacles, I hear. I hear. Now he goes on, how the chimney sweepers cry. Every blackening church appalls. Now he's talking about the church. And what's very interesting here is this is a synodoky. This is a type of metaphorical, figurative language where one thing symbolizes something so much greater. One church is not, he's not actually talking about a building, is he? Here, every blackening church. He's not talking about every church in the city of London, the physical architecture and building. It's what the church is symbolized and he capitalizes it, church. It's like a, it symbolizes something, okay? What does a church symbolize? It symbolizes a, a organized body of people. It symbolizes chartering. People often expand and, and uh, colonize in the name of religion, in the name of this, that, and the other. It's like the governmental body. Like, you can't really separate church and state, at least not in England, definitely not in London, and definitely not at the time of Blake when he was writing. They're kind of shackled together, aren't they? One goes with the other, hand in hand, okay? So, church symbolizes, hmm, religious. Religious oppression, I would say. Does Blake think that? I don't know, he loved the Bible. He loved the Bible. But the church is different from the Bible, isn't it? Scripture is different. You can have holy scripture and you can feel moved by the power and the word of God. But the church doesn't do that sometimes. The church imposes things that aren't even in the Bible. The church acts in strange ways and, uh, and acts in oppressive ways very often. Okay, so blackening church. He wants you to really see that. The church is blackening. So that means it's getting dirtier. Not actually physically blackening, although you, you could see that image and he wants to juxtapose chimney sweepers who are covered in soot and black and all that stuff with the church. Blackening. That means it's getting worse. It's not fully black yet. He's seeing it get corrupted. Hmm, interesting. And then he says... And the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. Runs in blood down palace walls. Palace is also a synodoky. It's also a metaphor where one thing stands in for another. What does a palace stand for? Kingly, queenly, monarchy, rule. It's, uh, it's government. So yeah, church and state are completely tied together. And you hear the soldier's sigh. And that's another synodoky. Soldier. 
there's so much in that sigh, isn't there? Because soldiers die, and they die for irrelevant causes, whether they believe it or not, sometimes they don't. They Sometimes they're pushed into war against their will. Sometimes they're not, but sometimes they are. What does that sigh symbolize? If you've ever met a soldier and you've seen him around like Remembrance Day, you know, and it's a soldier who's lost friends in battle, and he's quiet, and he sighs, you know there's blood in that sigh. You know there's blood, and where's that blood running? It's not running down the foreign land, in the sands, in the streets, in the burnt out shells of tanks, it's running down palace walls, basically saying, these figureheads have blood on their hands, and the church has blood on its hands, runs in blood down palace walls. And it's all related, isn't it? And then people walk through the streets, marks of weakness, marks of woe, it's all connected. Of course we're gonna feel weak and full of woe when people are dying and the church is controlling us and they're making us do things we don't want to do and keeping us down in the name of chartering. Interesting that he originally said dirty and then replaced it with chartering. Does Blake think chartering is synonymous with dirty? Hands can be dirty, can't they? Even if they're actually completely clean, your hands can be dirty and you can have blood on your hands. Interesting. There's so much in this and we, we're not going to be able to unpack all of it. I'm just giving you some things to think about and leap off of, okay? So I want you to read it again and go through it yourself and try and come up with something I haven't said yet. And he says, But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse, blasts the newborn infant's tear, and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. It's all connected. Marriage hearse. He's connecting the institution of marriage with this idea of death. It's like a, like a death knell, you know? It's all connected and the harlot is connected to the newborn infant and we're all the same and we're all oppressed and we're all kept down. That's William Blake's London. That's my short analysis. I don't, I could go on all day. I want you to fill in the blanks. Come up with something that I haven't said. What do you think of the poem? Do you agree with me? Disagree? Do you have a favourite bit? Do you like it? Just tell me what you think of the poem. Anything. Any idea is fine. It, there's no silly responses. It's all fine. Let me know in the comments below. And if you got some value out of this video, please like, share, subscribe, and I'll keep doing more. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed Blake's London.